Okay. Yeah, so go ahead and record it. Oh, recording, all right. <laughs> yep, just like that. <coughs> That's easy enough. Um, cool, right. yeah, and then I can, uh, you know, if you guys, if you want to share it with your members, we can figure out how to get you guys the hard copy. I also have a, a ton of resources that I'll be sending um, to you guys after the talk, and we'll kind of go over what those are, but some, okay. I'm not going to go over the recipes in a lot of detail in the talk, but I'll send, um, I'll send some PDFs afterward that we'll, oh, cool. everybody can reference. And uh, how, how long? You got 90 minutes? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, with question and answer, there's plenty of time. The talk okay. itself is about 50 minutes or an hour or so. Yeah, um, okay. And then, yeah, what I've been doing is uh, if people want to ask, ask questions either in the chat window or yeah. in there's a Q&A as well. Um, and then I can answer the questions after the talk or just in case if, if some of those get answered as the talk proceeds, easier than interrupting mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I can answer anyone's questions afterward. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I wonder. How's the, uh, how's the weather out there? You guys, mushroom season coming to an end now? It's not as pleasant anymore. It was super nice, beautiful fall. Mm -hmm. Now it's a little bit more rain. Yeah. But there are still plenty of mushrooms. Oh, good. If you have time to go. Right, Marlena? Marlena and Bill? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, threatened, it threatened with the hard frost a couple of weeks ago, but then it all backed off and warmed up again. So we yeah. got a couple of weeks out of it. Yeah, my so, organ friend said there was a major frost that came through and wiped out most of the big chanterelles and the cascades and whatnot. They're like, they're mushy, they're mushy post-frozen selves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, mushroom season is all but done here as far as like I can tell. But uh, was a, yeah, I'm excited. We'll be here through next mushroom season. So it should be really cool. Hopefully I'll be speaking Thai by then. <laughs> all right. That's a challenge. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's foreign in every way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many people are you expecting this morning? Or this afternoon, this evening? Um, hopefully. Cool. How long have you, so, how long has the club been active? Well, wow. since the 70s. 1972. Oh, wow. Awesome. 1972, yeah. there you go. Wow, amazing. Yeah, I just reached out to a couple clubs in the South and in Oklahoma. Um, they literally just formed their club last year. So they're brand new and they're like, we're really cool. We're, we're working out of a garden center and we're just all volunteers right now, but we're really excited. I'm like, congratulations, guys. That's, that's great. You have a new mushroom club. We are also all volunteers. This is not a professional. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, Everyone's volunteering. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And right now it's only a Zoom thing, which is good. Yeah. Because we can have you, but it's not so good because we can't show mushrooms really in person and have right. the tactile thing or do also some taste tester things you right. know make some meals whatever which we always had like around christmas we had a big potluck and then in the spring a big survivor potluck it's cool everybody brings some dishes and yeah. chairs and some of them have mushrooms so that's a very nice thing mm -hmm. you know community and you can just chat with everybody easier than in the Zoom thing. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, Santa Cruz had several potlucks that were mushroom themed, uh, the Santa Cruz group. And then, yeah, it's always a great thing to see what people are doing with their mushrooms and, you know, very, yeah. creative, very creative ways of, of utilizing them. Exactly. If you cool. come from different cultures, you have different um, approaches, yeah. And do I have, can I, do I have the ability to just mute everyone or? You um, you do. I'm not sure. Um, well, I mean, Zachary, the host, so you can mute everybody, and then they they may be able to manually unmute themselves, but uh, I, yeah. Why don't you go try try muting everybody right now, and then I'll see. Just be, oh, mute all. I see. There's the uh, mute all. Okay, and it looks like people can unmute themselves if they would yeah. like to. Yeah. So some. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I muted you again. <laughs> okay. uh, sometimes it's hard when you're presenting to check the chat. So I'll be quiet and stay um, 
unmuted and if I see something in chat that's a, like a question about something you specifically just said, I'll um, okay. raise my hand or call it out and you can answer that. So. Yeah, yeah, awesome. That sounds great. Yeah, if someone wants to monitor what the questions and whatnot, that'll be fine. Um, I mean, mostly yeah. the mute's just if someone's got a dog or a cat or kids running around and the audio jumps around a little bit. Yeah, so. that's, that's everybody. Yeah, right. So now where <laughs> Kitsap is the peninsula, is that right? Yep, just across uh, Puget Sound from Seattle. Okay. And oh. uh, Bremerton area. I mean, that's basically like the epicenter of mushrooms of the world, isn't it? It's like a, the Olympic uh, we're pretty Olympics. close to the pretty close to the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I think Northern California would like to be considered the epicenter and I don't want to argue with them, but we're. Well, Christian's we're, book is fantastic. So, you know, yeah. I mean, I yeah. think Oregon has something uh, better because they have the truffles. I still have not found ah, them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We might have them. We still have to find them. But Oregonians have truffles. Yeah, and so that's true. I still want those. So. I think my friend was doing a truffle farm up in uh, in Washington, on uh, like in Yakima. I thought, like in some of the drier areas where they were doing, uh, or they were doing a hazelnut orchard. I think, and they really? had, okay. They had seeded it with uh, the truffles in hopes that it would grow. Huh. Um, Stephanie. Ferrar, I'm trying to remember her name right now. That would really interest me, also how long she has have it, and if yeah. they found any some or whatever, that really would interest me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the North American Truffle Society is based out of Corvallis, Oregon, which is pretty incredible. Yeah, I know, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, truffles are always, I've, I've, never, I've never been successful. I'm always like, I get about 45 <laughs> seconds of digging, and then I'm like, well, I'm just <laughs> digging up the forest, <laughs> digging a hole, like, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I need to get yeah. myself a little pig. <laughs> so right. in order to make this possible, you know, with a dog is much better. Yeah. Small children I've heard and they can, can stay see the flies. <laughs> <laughs> then it's too late. Then you don't have it in the Then it's too late. Well, for that for that one trouble, maybe there's three next to it. <laughs> and still not determine because our smell our olfactory senses are not as good, so we can dig them out, but they're not necessarily perfect prime truffles. Mm -hmm. So see. that's the point. That's yeah. the secret. The dogs, the dogs can find the perfect prime. The dog can sniff it exactly the perfect timing. So uh, those okay. are the truffles you want to have. You know? Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, a rock hard pear or a green apple is no joy. Right. That's right. Yeah. No, or a rotten apple. <laughs> for that matter. Or a rotten apple. <laughs> <laughs> so it has to be in the right timing. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I'll assume everyone can hear me and I'll just repeat what I said. Or I can, yeah, it's 10 a.m. now, uh, whatever time, 7 p.m. there. Um, I'm going to go ahead, if you have questions, go ahead and write them, tap them into the chat window or the Q&A window and I will answer them or if somebody can kind of pay attention, I'll try to answer them at the end of the talk if they don't get answered uh, in the talk itself. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm here as long as you wanna ask me questions. Should be about an hour long presentation and um, hopefully I, I get most of those questions answered for you. Um, awesome. So yeah, if you think we're ready to get going, I will, uh, and get it yeah, started. 22 now, so maybe some more will click themselves in, but I think the time is five after seven. So I don't know, John, what do you think? Yeah, I think we should go ahead and get started. Do you want to introduce the speaker, Kirsten? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, I mean, you guys all read what we were kind of uh, showing in our newsletter we have Zachary Marcy and he's originally from Oregon we just learned now so from uh Shanghai. Yeah, no Oregon he's in Shanghai yes he is now in Shanghai mm -hmm. well, yeah <laughs> but he is originally from the North Pacific Pacific Northwest so he, that's why he knows of us and so that's the main important thing and um so he did um do um, formal cooking, French cooking, Pacific Northwest cooking, and um, 
kind of earth sciences and he has a cool blog called thefoodbender.com and I saw in there he has a cookbook which uh, is called quarantine cookbook maybe we can get that so very interesting things but he combines science and cooking and mushrooms all together and that makes me super happy because i think we all need something to get our spirits a little bit up and higher and food can do that right and mushrooms can do that so let's listen to safari wait right. when one thing, speaking of being happy, I just want to say I noticed um, my daughter Ruth has joined the call. All right. And she's living in Chicago. And I'm happy to have her because uh, uh, last year she studied for a semester in Chiang Mai. Oh, well, cool. And I had the opportunity to uh, visit her for a couple of weeks and we did a cooking class while we were there. So we're both very excited about hearing your presentation tonight. Oh, very cool. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Ruth. All right. Well, I'll, get, I'll go ahead and get started then. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, this is a talk that I've been presenting. Actually, it was prompted. I, I was meant to um, uh, try actually in September and October was going to be one of my busiest, busiest couple months ever. I was, I was going to be in Michigan, Minnesota, Denver, Washington, D.C., uh, Washington State, Oregon, all for doing live mushroom presentations and cooking demos. And uh, I ended up here. And as it turns out, the rainy season here is similar to uh, in Mexico, which is the summertime, or what, you know, what we would, we're in the Northern Hemisphere still here. So May through September, although it's still raining here and there. So I think it's actually May into October. Um, and that's mushroom season here. So I got very lucky. We showed up here on May 10th. Um, just as the rains were kicking in, which gets rid of the smoke in the air, burning season before that. And, um, and so we got a chance to go hiking and, and explore the area and started learning Thai. So I wanted to present you sort of what I've found here. This is a little bit of Thai language, a little bit of food, uh, and a lot of mushrooms. So I hope you all enjoy that. So you may be wondering right now, what is the Lana Kingdom? Um, the Lana Kingdom was actually founded in the 1200s by King Mangre, and uh, he, he basically joined a bunch of uh, the, the local cities and whatnot into a, into a, into a kingdom in the north. Uh, what is Chiang Mai now was the Lana Kingdom, and it was around um, in then a Burmese vassal state and then had its own king until 1939. So the Lana Kingdom has its, is, is very distinctly different from, from the Thailand that was exported to the United States and very distinctly from the, different from the Thailand in the south. And the people here uh, speak different dialects, there's different words, and, uh, and they don't eat the same cuisine, which is pretty exciting. Um, so up there, number two up there is where, is where I am now, that is Chiang Mai. You can see the, the northern Thai sort of bit there uh, juts up into the into the Southeast Asian Peninsula and into Burma. So Burma at one point did have Lana as the as a vassal state uh, and that that made uh, that made Siam a little nervous so they they joined up with Lampoon and with Lana and uh, took it back. So um, this is a little video I put together of you can kind of get the mountains um, where Chiang Mai is. This is um, for anyone who's interested in geology, basically the Indian subcontinent is slamming up into the Asian peninsula or into the Asian continent, which is causing the Himalayas to form. And the Southeast Asian peninsula is sort of the toothpaste squeezing out around uh, India as it juts up into this, you know, they're both above, above the water, so no subduction zone. And uh, the mountains here are long folding mountains uh, that are typical of areas like that. And um, not far from here, is uh, Doi, Doi Itanon. Doi Itanon is about 7,500 feet. That is the tallest uh, mountain in, uh, in Chiang Mai. I was talking to some of the folks before, and how did I find myself here? Well, uh, as you know, 2020 happened. Um, my, uh, my now fiance and I, I, I proposed to her since we've been in Thailand, but we had uh, packed up both of our houses in January with the intent to move to Mexico. Uh, we had a wedding to attend to. Actually, she married some friends over here. And um, then we had a festival to go to. And the day before the festival, the whole country went into lockdown. Everything was canceled. The people that were there for the festival, we got stuck together for seven weeks on a beach. Um, and then it became quite clear that going home wasn't the best option. 
Uh, and so we moved up to Chiang Mai, which is something I've been interested in for food. And it uh, turns out we'll probably be here throughout 2021. So I don't see any, I don't think we'll be leaving here in the next year. Well, that's pretty, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and the experience is exciting is because we were going to Mexico to study cuisine and textiles. And uh, there is um, almost no richer place for cuisine than here in, in the Lana Kingdom. And the reason for that is because the Lana food is not Thai food. So what they call the, the word here, ahan, ahan means food. So ahan Thai is different from ahan muang. Uh, ahan muang is where, is where we are now. And part of that is because we are, as, as that map show, we're jutting up into Burma, Laos, Cambodia, very close to Vietnam. And um, a lot of Chinese, uh, uh, the folks that fought the communists fled to Thailand um, and brought a lot of their cuisine with them from Yunnan, uh, and there's a lot of Silk Road spices up here, so very different in the sense uh, that in Southern Thailand it's very coconut and chili heavy, uh, and up here it's very uh, spices, a lot of unique spices that I haven't seen elsewhere. And then there's, um, we've, we've gone to a few trade shows in the, uh, up here, there's a lot of Thais that have traveled abroad and come back and brought some of the modernization. Um, and it's really neat to see the young entrepreneurs, what they're doing with food, and, like their new packaging, there's a whole like, uh, program in Bangkok for uh, launching new businesses and uh, helping rebuild your brand and uh, so it's been really neat to see the trade shows and to see what kids are doing these days so also some some modernization of food up here as well this is a very typical northern Thai meal um, this is my fiance in the upper uh, left there and some of my my Thai friends and chefs that I've met but this is very typical and what you'll see right in the middle there is a huge plate of herbs and raw vegetables this is very, very common that you'll eat a small bite of a nam prick, which is like a chili, a chili paste, a little bit of salad, a mouthful of herbs, a bite of this, and you're just sort of very handsy. Everyone's reaching over each other, sticky rice, you know, making little small bites, and it's very active and very involved. Um, and so it's been really fun to sort of uh, to break into that cuisine. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some Thai language. You know, this is they're they're very into their open fires here. So uh, some, some techniques that they use. Grilling here is called ping. Uh, so if you grill some fish, bla ping. Um, if you, uh, you want to char some eggplant, makua pao. Pao means charred or burnt. Uh, dried mushrooms, head hang, or head hang, sorry. Um, that, is, uh, that means dried. Boiling, you might know, tom ka, fairly, fairly common in Thai restaurants. Tom actually means boiled. Um, and tom ka is boiled galangal, guy is chicken. So that actually is, is very common if you see any of the brothy soups. Uh, tom is often in front of them. Stir fry means pad, and I learned this recently. Uh, pad prick gang. Pad does not mean noodle. So we think pad thai, pad cu. It actually means uh, is, is stir fry. And so uh, a pad prick gang is a uh, green a green papaya that uh, that has been stirred up with uh, like a curry paste and, and stir fried. It's amazing. Um, Steaming here is nung, so if you steam vegetables, pak nung, uh, and to fry is tod. You know, here they have tonal language, so uh, what we learned is tod, 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 tod. Those are all, those are five different words, believe it or not. Um, but in this case, <laughs> mu tod uh, means to fry, deep fried. Uh, kua is like a high heat saute. Uh, lap kua is, a, is like a ground meat dish. And then to mash, which is pretty much everything you do, you can see the tools of the trade that are behind the words, is tom. So uh, a uh, the papaya salad, tom tom, is uh, basically a sour mash. You know, you're just constantly smashing things up. Um, so to eat here is actually the same as to eat rice. You know, the, uh, the word gin is to have. And so to have rice means to eat. So have you, have you had rice is uh, have you eaten. And similarly, have you, drink, have you had water is have you had anything to drink? Um, so it's very much based on rice. And in fact, Lana means one million rice fields. Um, and when you drive around, there's at least one million rice fields around here. It's nuts. As far as the eye can see, all the way up the hill, terraced into the valley, it's just insanely beautiful. And one of the reasons I was talking beforehand, there's a real communal effort here. The rice fields are still harvested by the community together. Um, and so when, when it's time to harvest the rice, everybody moves and everyone harvests one field, moves to the next field. And so the whole community is still coming together to produce food. Um, and it's not very automated as much as like agricultural. There's quite a bit of agricultural corn in the mountains, but for the most part, the rice itself is still very community uh, oriented. So food and cuisine is ahan, so ahan Thai, or as I said here in Northern Thailand, ahan muang. 
Uh, a restaurant is a, is a place of business that sells food or a store, food store, Ran Ahan. And then the, the meals are sort of named for the time of the day that you eat them. So Ahan Grang Wan is food in the midday. Um, so with mushrooms, this is fun. Now, so in Thailand, everything they do is done with the general term first. So uh, if, if we said shiitake mushroom in the way they would be like mushroom shiitake or uh, mushroom amanita. So every mushroom here is called head. Uh, they have this earth star truffle that comes out early, early in the year, head tob. Uh, they do a lot with onomatopoeia. It's pretty fun. Like the word for cat is meow. Uh, the word for dog is ga. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the word for head in this, the, the mushroom is like a popping mushroom. It's called head pop. And tob is the sound it makes when it pops. Uh, shiitake's here, good smelling mushroom, head home. Home is a really useful word when you're at the markets because you just say home to any of the grandmothers. It means, oh, it smells so good. Um, and they, you get a smile. Uh, oyster mushrooms, a head nong pa, that's an angel wing, actually means wing of an angel. And I like mushrooms a lot. Chon chop head mat kap. Uh, or I would like to eat mushrooms, chan yak in head cup, uh, which always gets a smile from people. I like to tell people I'm, I'm a head cone uh, mushroom person. Um, now tracking mushrooms down here has been really, really interesting because as usual, uh, in a place with a university, you find some really cool information. And there is in fact up north of here, the Mushroom Research Center. I don't know if anyone is familiar with uh, Dennis Dejardin. He's a uh, instructor and PhD out of uh, Palo Alto. But Dennis has been to Thailand over 30 times, uh, helped found the Mushroom Research Center with Dr. Kevin Hyde, who's still here up in Chiang Rai. And this is a, uh, a, field, stu a field study center. There's uh, for people to stay from one week to up to three months. They have a microscopy lab. Um, they're they're you know, usually for the, for the students themselves, but they're situated up in the mountains on the way to Pai, um, probably about 2,000 or 1,500 feet up. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's been a major place for a lot of the research uh, into the mushrooms around, around the area. Thailand also has a really strong national parks and conservation. They have, uh, especially up here in the north, there's a massive amount of area that's, just, that's, that's uh, reserved for national parks. In fact, one of the things that came out of the quarantine is they, they closed the national parks for several months uh, during the lockdown. And the amount of wildlife that came back was astounding to them. And so now they're talking about closing every national park on a rotating schedule of three months at a time to allow it to rewild itself. Um, so that's pretty neat. There's, they're taking some lessons um, from what that looks like. Uh, and I'll show you a poster in a second that the Thai National Parks put out for edible mushrooms. And also that's one of the resources I will send all you guys afterwards. You'll get a copy uh, of this poster. Um, lots of scholarly articles from Chiang Mai University and the University up in Chiang Rai. Um, mostly in English, um, so that's been really fun to sort of uh, look into the various studies of, of different mushrooms. Uh, local Guides and Chefs has been limited this year. My anticipation is that next year when I speak more Thai, that I'll be able to, to get on some more of the local guides and, and understand a little more uh, of what that looks like. But it's been really fun to talk to the chefs and see their excitement for different mushrooms. Uh, and then fairly recently, I got to visit the Chiang Mai University Microbiome Research Lab. And that was really exciting. That was from, from Dennis DeHardin. This is Dr. Yai. He just finished his PhD in uh, doing a large scale, as you can see, large scale commercial cultivation of black bully. And if I'm not mistaken, this is one of the first commercially cultivated bullies. Um, it's the Phlebopus portentosus. It's a huge black bully with yellow flesh, similar to like the butter bully. Absolutely delicious. They do grow wild here. Um, but Dr. Yai found that they seem to kill their host plant. And he's like, oh, this is a parasitic mushroom. But found out that it creates these like air pockets that a, a different parasite can get in and eat the roots of this plant. The plant dies and the mushroom goes from being uh, uh, mycorrhizal to being saprobic and starts to eat the dead materials. So he thought, well, hey, if we can cultivate this, let's see what we can do. I got to visit the lab and check it out. And in fact, it can be cultivated. So this is pretty exciting. This is like a new product both for Thailand for uh, meeting nutritional objectives of the local area, but also as an export product, perhaps. Um, they actually just recently discovered the Thai truffle. There is a Thai white truffle up here. Uh, that is a picture of this, this booklet right here, which is really quite fun. It's like an entire celebration that the university put out about the Thai white truffle. Uh, in the green shirt there is Dr. Yai, who you just saw. Um, doc, Dr. Tan in the, uh, the sweater is the one who actually got to name the truffle. And uh, Dr. Sizemorn is the professor emeritus of biology here in Chiang Mai, 
Um, and so it was her, her microbial research lab that discovered it. And it is apparently as good as the organ trouble. Um, and they're still doing research. They've said they've seen some centipedes eating them, but they have not been able to figure out who is digging the truffles up or why the truffles, you know, what, what caused them to be successful here. So the, the research is ongoing, but this was like just in, uh, in, in 2018 was the celebration of this event. Um, so this is a very new, there is, there's still a lot of stuff being discovered about Thai mushrooms um, and they're doing the genetic research now and, and trying to understand what makes the Thai mushrooms different. So this is a uh, edible, edible Thai mushrooms here. Um, the first three letters at the very top actually say head. Um, and I'm not actually, I don't know. If the, the problem with reading the language is that, uh, you know, even if you know how to say it, you don't know what the words mean once you pronounce it. Um, I will send a copy of this to everyone. Now, Dr. DeHardine says that basically every Latin name on this is pretty much wrong because they're named after North American and European species because that's sort of what uh, a lot of the, the Western mycologists do when they roll in. Um, and some of these have now been tracked to the Himalayas and to the Indian, um, Indian ph phylogeny. So uh, some of these mushrooms are not, most of these mushrooms are not coming at all from North America or, or from Europe at all. Uh, and so expect that over the next few years, there's going to be quite a few new, new mushrooms named, even though they, you know, the colloquial names and, and, the, and the names are known uh, in Thai, but the Latin names ought to be getting a major update as well. So. I decided that I needed to put together more, a more comprehensive list of all the, all the edible mushrooms here in Thailand. So I've been collecting all that information and putting it into a spreadsheet for myself. There are 67 on that poster. Um, I found about 30 or so in various research papers and websites about the different edibles. And then I've identified uh, four species that I've recognized uh, from just hiking around in the area that I hadn't seen mentioned anywhere in the literature. And so I put together a, uh, a spreadsheet of all the edible mushrooms in Thailand. And what I'm hoping to do is, is by the end of next year, I'd like to write uh, a book on the edible mushrooms in Thailand. So that's, that's sort of where we're going with this. Um, I have a uh, member site on the Patreon page. It's uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash mycophagy book. Um, it's a sort of a monthly people support me, my research and whatnot uh, on a monthly basis. All of my spreadsheets and everything that I create goes onto that page for people to access so they can see the research happening in progress. So yeah, there's about 99 uh, mushrooms on here right now. And as I learn more about the Thai and, and their, and their season, seasonability and how they're being used, that all goes on there. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what we see around here. So cultivated mushrooms are huge in Asian culture. Um, and uh, as you probably know, uh, these, are, these are some pretty common mushrooms that you've seen. Head halm, as we talked about before, good smelling mushroom, that's shiitakes. Uh, head kem tong is the enoki. And you actually see the enokis both in the bunched white, like uh, in the way that you see them often, but you also see them growing quite a lot bigger as well. Um, the head nong pha oyster is very common. It's, uh, it's often steamed and served at every meal. Now what I, I didn't realize, they eat split gill here. They cultivate, uh, they cultivate and eat split gill mushroom. Uh, Schizophyllum commune, I saw that in the markets as well. The straw patty mushroom, which is the, uh, the Bulvaria volvesia, um, that comes out of the little egg. That's very common uh, in Asian mushrooms, head fang. Um, the head hunu, the jelly ear, also known as black fungus, or the black, the black fungus in Chinese or in, in egg drop soup, um, they call head hunu. Uh, I did not find the Thai name yet for the beach mushroom or the king oyster mushroom. And they have this cute little thing where they, they have the king oysters, but they only let them get like this big. And these tiny little mushrooms, they just throw them in whole with everything. And they're very awesome and brown up mm. really, really well. So this is very common to find, um, so far, at least for the six months we've been up here. Um, this is my favorite mushroom lady here. And uh, you can see sort of down on the, on the lower left, that's the, the, the king oysters that are, that are clipped when still quite small. Um, they even use the butts of the, of the mushrooms and cut them up. Uh, in the back there, sort of above the M, that is the head tall. That is a wild mushroom. And that is a very controversial mushroom, in fact. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but it's, uh, it's sort of the, t the local Thai truffle, not the white truffle, but a different thing. You can see all, all kinds of stuff here. The, this is in, the, in our market that's maybe 200, 300 meters from our house. Um, very large market that is uh, at high peak time at 8.30 in the morning, done by 11 a.m. Um, really, really awesome. And this has been where I've learned a lot of my Thai, just coming back to the same ladies again and again and saying, oh, how do you say this? How do you say this? Um, so there's also a lot of... Uh, 
forage mushrooms that end up in the marketplace. Now, what's amazing about this, and I thought this was fascinating, I haven't seen any of these mushrooms in the States for the most part. I mean, Russula's, yes. Um, but for the most part, uh, these, these did not have English common names, which was really exciting to sort of explore a whole new realm. So head tall, uh, that's the Australis hygrometricus. That is a uh, un unopened earth star. They call them like the earth star truffle. So it's, a pre it's not open. It is, an, it is a hypogeous mushroom. It grows under the ground and as a result has a very intense uh, smell. So for harvesting it, similar to truffles, you need to be able to dig it out of the ground and smell it before you find it. Uh, head bod is this really intense uh, lentinous mushroom. It's, it's so tough, but it is like the best, uh, the best uh, agaricus uh, princip princip princips. It's like uh, the Prince agaricus flavor, just that most intense, awesome mushroom flavor, uh, but you can't chew through it. That's pretty fun. Uh, head head concal is uh, uh, the squerulosula. Um, it looks like an oyster mushroom, except it comes up in the middle as opposed to the, on the edge, and it grows out of palm trees, uh, big white mushroom, uh, really, really tender and delicious. The one I showed you before and also behind the, uh, the text here, the head har, that's the Phlebopus portentosus that they're uh, cultivating, I believe. Um, the head loam, they kind of call several of the rusulas. Um, they kind of all group them all together. There's like white ones, yellow ones, and, and green ones, and they kind of all call them the same. Thing. I'm not a big fan of Russo's myself. I got to figure out how to make them taste better. Kind of um, head calm, they kind of call a, a number of the termitomyces. So there's quite a bit of termite mounds around here and they'll get gigantic harvests of mushrooms. And there's several varieties of termitomyces. Mm -hmm. um, the termitomyces striatus was the one that I, was, uh, I saw the most often. They have their own Caesar amanita here. And this is actually one of the mushrooms they have discovered and done the DNA on. That's amanita hemipapha. Um, so it's related to the Amanita Caesarea. Uh, they call that head Kai Han. And then they have chanterelles here, which was super exciting because I actually found them in the woods before I saw them in the market. Uh, and they call them kamin is the word for, or for, uh, for turmeric. So it's the head kamin, the turmeric mushroom. Uh, and it's as far as I can tell what they're calling is cantharellus minor, although that is again a North American mushroom. So probably that will also change. So this is head tall. As you can see, it has quite a, uh, a, quite a rigid shell around it. And it's actually, it, it, is, it is eaten whole because it pops in your mouth. And not just like, oh, it pops a little bit. I mean, it goes, like, it really is quite an enjoyable <laughs> thing. Um, and oftentimes you'll see them in soup uh, and very flavorful, very like mushroomy, uh, not quite truffly, um, but almost like a overripe porcini uh, flavor, like really, really intense. I ended up freezing some and it made the, the fridge stink just from them being in the freezer, uh, made the fridge stink for several weeks, uh, which I was thrilled about, but my uh, fiance was not so happy about. Um, this is the head har. These are the black, the black bolates. As you can see, even their gill, the gill surface is a bit black um, or brown, I guess, if you will. Yellow flesh, really, really beautiful, delicious, like any, any, any bolete, um, really, really, really tasty. And, and they get quite large, like kilo, kilo and a half on some of the larger mm -hmm. specimens. And I, not too buggy either. I, I, grabbed a, I grabbed one of the bigger specimens just to see, and very few understand. bugs. Um, so you can see some, some bites from rats and squirrels that have eaten them. Um, I bought these from this lady. Uh, and before I could even take a picture of them, the, the grandmas had grabbed them and take them into the kitchen. So I didn't get any pictures of these before they were cooked. It was a very simple uh, fish sauce and, and uh, shallot and green onion preparation. But this is one of the, uh, the Termatomyces mushrooms, really tender, uh, mild flavor, really delicious, um, and, and served very plain, you know, very simple, very simple preparation. This is the, uh, the polycroyus, the lentinous polycroyus that I was saying. It's um, the, the, the stipe itself, you literally cannot chew through it. It is like the toughest uh, thing that you, that you, that I've experienced other than like lemongrass or, you know, a lot of the food they have, uh, you know, here they'll just chop the chicken up and throw it in. So there's little bits of bone and like you just kind of get around that. Um, and so I, I suppose this mushroom fits that vibe. Um, <laughs> the, guild, the guild part was actually quite tender, but the flavor on these was something to pursue. Just absolutely delicious, really intense. Um, like I said, a, like an agaric, a Prince Agaricus, like the, the, it was like uh, a Portobello times four, like just the most awesome flavor. Um, so those are really fun to cook with. And uh, these are the chanterelles here. And this is actually in the marketplace. 
Um, yeah, that's bamboo, or that's uh, banana leaves that they're sitting on there. So you can see these are actually very, very tiny, like uh, maybe golf tea, golf tea size. Um, really, really oh, tiny oh. mushrooms. Hands down, the most aromatic, flavorful mushroom chanterelle I've ever had in my life. I smelled them in the woods before I saw them. I was like, they're chanterelles. Oh my God, they're tiny. <laughs> they're like the size of a nickel. Um, so that was really exciting. And they were around for a good four weeks. So that was really fun. I got to play with those a lot. Uh, and then I wanted to go over a few of the mushrooms that we found in the woods um, that I haven't seen the Thai names for. Oh, that's not quite true. Hedgehog I did find is called Tooth Mushroom here, uh, Head Foam. Um, and the uh, Amanita Hemibafa, as I mentioned before. But I did see a beefsteak mushroom out in the woods. That was pretty interesting. There's a bunch of chinkapin trees at about 4,000, 4,500 feet. Um, I saw some wild reishi mushrooms. That was very cool. Of course, the split gills, the chanterelles. Uh, and I found a giant puffball, which so far isn't listed. The, the asterisk mushrooms are, are the names there are probably not the right names, um, uh, according to Dennis, but they haven't been tracked. There is a giant puffball that's known here, but it is not the one that I found. So we're interested. We carried the giant puffball out through one of the Hmong villages, and they were like, you'll die. <laughs> I was like, no, no, it's edible. You can, you can have it. And they're like, no, 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 no. It was delicious. <laughs> so, uh, and then some interesting uh, Tilopolis or some other strange mushrooms that I still need to find. You know, the, uh, I have this, I don't know if everyone's used iNaturalist. If you haven't, you definitely should download that program. It is phenomenal. Um, it is terrible at identifying Thai mushrooms. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's this Western one. You're like, no, it really isn't though. I'm sorry. Um, but you know, there's, you, look at, uh, you, look, you can look by location of the mushrooms that have been ID'd in the area and there's like five people have been here maybe looking at mushrooms, so it's been pretty fun. Um, so this is Chiang Mai from the air, or from, uh, from uh, Google Earth, if you will. That little dot in the center is sort of Wat Chetty. That's the very dead center of Chiang Mai. You can see that square around it. That square is a moat uh, that runs around the old city. It's about, uh, it's about 1,200 or so years old. You can see how close the airport is. And my house is just about where the A is in the Haya subdistrict, uh, right below the city there. Um, it's about 200,000 people in the city itself, but the, the province of Chiang Mai has about 2 million people in it, and it's very spread out. Uh, but it is the second most uh, populous city in Thailand after the 25 million person Bangkok. So it's a quite a cultural hub, it's quite a, a, and it's, it's quite a hub. I'm going to zoom in real quick onto the mountains there uh, on the left side, um, and you can kind of see this is where we did a lot of our hiking. Um, this is Doi Pui right here. You can, it's about 4,500, I think it goes up to 5,200 feet at the very peak. Um, and then just swinging around there on the lower right hand side in a second, that is a Hmong village. There's several hill tribes and the hill tribes almost uh, ignore borders. So the Hmong tribes are in Vietnam, in, uh, in Laos and in Thailand, as well as, as some in China. This Hmong village is, is, uh, has a massive valley where they've permacultured out the entire valley with like just the most incredible uh, I mean, it must be a hundred year old orchard. Uh, I believe it was lychees, um, but I'm not really sure. Uh, so you start your hiking at the Hlong village. You can hike up through these woods. Um, it's quite lovely. Let's see here. Let's see. All right. So this is uh, pretty much around that viewpoint. This is Doi Pui National Park. Um, the forest here is very mixed. As you can see, that's a pine tree there. The pine trees start at about 4,000 feet. And then by the time you get up to 5,000, it's all pine. A lot of the uh, Amanitas are growing up there, but there's also eucalyptus, there's several kinds of oak, there's the chinkapin, uh, teak trees, there's the, um, the diptocarpus, which is uh, usually around 1,800 to 2,300 feet, and that's what the chanterelles grow with. And so depending on your ele elevation, I think Chiang Mai is about um, 800 or so feet up, and then the mountains go up. Uh, I haven't been up to Doi Ithanon yet at 7,500 feet, that's the tallest point in Thailand. But it's a half an hour motorbike ride and you're up in the mountains. And the roads here are really, really well done. Um, so it's been really great. Well, this is the, uh, the local Caesar Amanita. Um, really, really delicious. And, and I find a lot of the edible Amanitas to be quite fishy. And in Thailand, that works really well because they put fish in every single recipe. It's either shrimp paste or fish paste or fermented fish paste. Uh, so this made a really good non prick head, which I will give it, share the recipe with uh, soon. Really gorgeous mushroom, really fun to have in the, in the dishes as well. 
Uh, my fiance is attracted to hedgehogs everywhere we go. And lo and behold, she found a whole patch of hedgehogs here. Um, so I'm calling these Hydnum umbilic umbilicatum because they are more on the small side, but I don't think that's what they are. Uh, and apparently they are called tooth mushrooms, head, head phone. Um, but they were super delicious. Um, and uh, that was really exciting to find these because I haven't seen them mentioned anywhere in the literature. This found the chinkapin tree first and I was like, haha, wouldn't that be funny if there were beefsteak mushrooms here, which are hard to find anyway. Um, and, uh, and lo and behold, right around the corner, there was one right there. Wasn't in a good enough state to take, let it chill, uh, and hopefully you can go back and find some more later. But that was really neat. Um, fun, fun and strange mushroom to find. These are the head kameen. As you can see, these are micro, tiny, tiny, tiny little chanterelles. They took a lot of work to pick. They're extremely filthy. And unlike most chanterelles, it is very hard to clean each individual one before you throw it in the bag. Good Lord. Um, but they're pretty sturdy. They hold up well to be rinsed. And uh, wow, they are so fragrant. Like just apricot, mossy, woody, like everything you want from a chanterelle. Uh, and uh, did pretty well in picking these, except that we are, we are about um, 15 kilometers into a 12 kilometer hike at this point, which we had not prepared for. And the mosquitoes were ravaging us through this point. And I was like, I can't stop, I have to stop, I can't stop. Um, so that was pretty fun. I got enough, a small handful. Um, and then they started popping up in the market. So that was great. Uh, this was the reishi mushroom we found. Um, very cool. Uh, where my thumb is was about where I was coming out of the duff. And so it had, uh, it had quite a, uh, uh, quite a long stipe that went down into the, into the ground underneath it. We found several of them and, and picked two, uh, made some tea from them. Oh, this was on the monk's trail. There's actually a, an old trail that runs up from the city to a forest temple where there's a waterfall flowing out of the temple itself. So gorgeous. Um, and this, this, this mushroom was on that trail going up there. So that felt really special. Um, you know, the Chinese symbols, uh, the, Mandar the Mandarin symbols for reishi actually means shaman praying for rain. Those are the symbols uh, of Horatio Mushroom, the Ling Chi. Uh, and here they call Luan, Luan, Chao, Luan Chua. Um, and so that was really neat. This is, the, this is actually the smaller of the puffballs we found. And part of my face there is because this thing stinks <laughs> to high heaven. Um, and we did actually find one uh, up this little creek valley uh, right after that. It was probably twice that size um, and uh, was, was really amazingly delicious. Um, and here's some split gill, really cute little uh, little little pink and purple edges. They're really fun to find. And then this was this, this strange. I couldn't tell if this was a moldy, a molded bullet, or if this was actually what the bullet looked like itself. We were like driving by on the motorbike, and I was like, "Stop! <laughs> what is that?" Um, did not take them home. Uh, just kind of left them where they were. And uh, was, this was at the end of that 18 kilometer hike, and all of us were melting. We were just done. So I was like, well, I can't be bothered right now. But really interesting, uh, really interesting mushrooms to explore here. So excited for next, next season. Um, meanwhile, I get to cook all the, all the other mushrooms. So how do they eat them here? That was really interesting. Um, very little coconut up here. You know, there's a, the, if, for those who have been here, um, the, the sort of na the, the national dish of lana is cow soy, which is a, is a coconut curry. But other than that, they do a lot of clear broth soups. Um, the word for curry is gang, um, and up here those gangs also are, are, are clear broth soups. So they'll often be like pork bones, a bunch of mushrooms, some greens, and uh, what they call nam prick. So the chili paste um, they call nam prick. Nam prick is very common up here. And if you've ever made a Thai curry from scratch, um, the, the curry paste that you're buying, that is essentially a nam prick. Um, but what they call those is non prick gang. Those are those are non pricks specifically meant to make curries. Up here they have what they call non prick chim, which means non pricks that you don't. You just have them on the table. So you'll take a little bit, spread it on your rice, eat it with some veggies. And so non prick head is very common. Um, so any mushroom that you take, you mash it up with uh, with chilies, garlic, and shallots, and just serve that in a little bit of fish sauce, or shrimp paste. Uh, and you, you serve that with your meal and sort of have that on your, on your rice. And like I said, you're very handsy reaching all over the place. And then Nam Prik Ka, the Ka is Galangal, uh, is very commonly served with the head tulb and with the steamed oyster mushroom. So it's like a, a flavor pairing that you'll see all over in a lot of the menus. It's Nam Prik Ka, steamed mushrooms. I'm not a big fan of the steamed mushroom. Can't really get behind that. It's just sort of a floppy, tasteless, strange. Uh, I think there's much better ways of preparing them. 
uh, often you'll see them as a side, as I showed before, like sauteed with garlic or chilies, uh, just sort of as a veg side. And then really most interesting, and it's just that lady that I was showing you at the market, she makes uh, what's called nam. Nam is generally a fermented pork, uh, fermented raw pork. Well, they'll mix it with sticky rice, leave it on the counter for three days, and it ferments, like lacto-fermentation. In uh, Isan, which is East Thailand, they do not cook it, and they eat it uh, in its fermented raw form. Up here, they, they tend to grill it. Uh, in its banana wrapping. But she makes nam head, which is a, a vegan version of that, and she ferments mushrooms. And they're really, really tasty. They get quite sour, uh, and they're really good with eggs, and it's a whole mix of mushrooms. And I'm not sure if there's a recipe as much as you just sort of put them in there with some garlic and some sticky rice, like not that much, and uh, knead it up and then wrap it in banana leaf and let it sit out, and it lacto-ferments, and then it keeps for, for several weeks after that. This is, a, this is a garden at our property. It's been really fun here to learn how to cook and to identify. Almost every leaf you see in that garden is edible. Um, leaves of trees, there's a cinnamon tree. We can actually harvest cinnamon bark right off the tree here. We have licorice leaves. There's all kinds of really interesting um, and things. And that building behind it this is my fiance's gift at finding amazing Airbnbs. She found me a cooking school. So there's literally a cooking school on the property. There's, a, there's actually two other houses besides ours that now have our friends in them as well. So we've kind of taken over this little green corner in the middle of the city. Um, so let's look at a few of the recipes. I've had to uh, get them to arrange the recipes on the cutting board for me. The, the grandmothers here don't use recipes. There's nothing written down. So they just like grab a handful of this and grab a handful of that. And they're like, this is how you do it. I'm like, but wait, how, how will I know? Uh, so I just said, well, let's just put them down on the cutting board and let me take a picture. And so uh, I've been writing a cookbook from here using this as my recipe guide. So up at the top, there's some washed head tob. That's uh, the head har, uh, the phlebopis. And then basically, this is, your, this is a basic nom prick. Uh, this is a nom prick noom. Nom prick, those are uh, prick noom. Prick is the word for chili. Those long green ones, they're not that spicy. Uh, not, not even jalapeno spicy. Uh, prick noom. Uh, and then basically garlic and, uh, and shallot and, and however much spicy Thai chilies you want in there. That's the basis for a lot of the non pricks, the green, more liquidy one. Uh, and so non prick head is made like that. And I will share you, I'll, I'll send a recipe uh, over to you guys afterward uh, via email. So you'll have this. Um, this is the uh, Nam head. This is, uh, as a, this is post fermentation, but basically like shredded mushrooms, a little sticky rice. They fold it up in this, tightly, this tight bundle uh, and seal it with a chopstick and just let it sit out and it ferments and it becomes a very sour, uh, fantastic. Fantastic dish, like little, they're like nice little packets too. It's probably like two ounces of mushrooms. Um, so nice, great for a meal. Um, and this is one that I wanted to share because it got a little, got a little crazy. This is actually all to make a curry paste. Um, and I decided that I wanted to make a, uh, a sort of a Penang based curry with all those chanterelles that I picked when the mosquitoes were attacking me. So down in the lower left, you can see all the, all the spices. There's black cardamom in there. Uh, that longer one is called deeply in Thai. It's Balinese long pepper. Um, Alan Rockefeller actually turned me on to that as the most similar to the Matsutake flavor uh, available in a spice. So if you if you can order long you know Balinese long pepper for really cheap on Amazon or several spice stores, I highly recommend it. There's actually the original uh, the the word uh, papili in in Sanskrit is what ended up being our word pepper. This was the most common pepper before the Ottoman Empire. Uh, shut down the Silk Road, and it was one of the reasons that that uh, uh, Cristobal Colombo decided to go across the oceans to go find Queen Isabella pepper, right? And one of the reasons that uh, that, that bell peppers are called peppers is because Mr. Columbus uh, screwed that one up. And you know, uh, if you look at uh, allspice, it's actually uh, pimenton officinalis. It's, uh, it's, it's named also after pepper because Christopher Columbus screwed that one up. So pepper is actually deeply uh, and one of the commonly used um, spices here. And uh, you mash all this together with your, your thing and you end up with a chili paste. And so that chili paste was then used to make you know, more of a coconut curry. And after letting it sit for one day, the chanterelle flavor was coming out of every corner of that curry. It was amazing. I was like building the chanterelles actually into the paste itself and then using that. I am also sending this recipe to you guys um, because it gets pretty complicated up here, as you can see. Um, but man, they got really good at mashing things. In fact, the name for the pestle up here is a uh, sack. 
which is similar to my name. So I often introduce myself as, as SAC <laughs> to folks. It's a, a croc la sac. There's a mortar and pestle up here. Um, so yeah, really, really fun. Now, I know what you might be thinking because I was thinking the same thing. <sighs> Thought you knew Thai food? No, probably not actually. Northern Thai food is so unique and so different and so, uh, so varied. But don't worry, I've got you covered. I've been writing a cookbook since I've been here. Six months or so, I'm about 50,000 words in. Uh, I'm hoping to have this out uh, by the beginning of, uh, of 2021. I'm, I'm talking to editors right now. And it's, it's written in a, in a journal sense, so it's not necessarily an authoritative cookbook on the North, but it's my experience with diving in and the various teachers um, that I've had. It's been really exciting sort of to, to be in a place where I didn't expect to be. Um, however, if you do want an authoritative Northern Thai cookbook, this one here is definitely the one. This is The Food of Northern Thailand. It's last year's release by Austin Bush. He's a photographer uh, that lives here in Thailand, um, a Farang foreigner. But this book has just been an amazing guide. Um, uh, and I can't recommend it enough. The photography is amazing. The personal stories are amazing. And it really, really explains the different regions of Northern Thailand. Um, so speaking of chanterelles, I wanted to share this because I just recently uh, have been putting this together. So my other project, the, the mycophagy book, is to actually look at the chemical composition of chanterelles or of all the various mushrooms, break them down for, for the chefs that are more interested in chemistry. And so I actually have uh, got a chart now, the volatile and sensory profiles of chanterelles. Um, and uh, this is available to the members on my page, but uh, breaking down basically all the various volatile chemicals that make a chanterelle smell like a chanterelle. Uh, in addition to that, it's the, uh, the umami components, the uh, carbohydrates, the fats. Uh, and I think some of those things are important because, for example, in some mushrooms when you're browning them, we don't know yet if we're using the caramelization reaction, which is the browning of sugars, mushroom sugars, or the Maillard reaction, which would be the browning of the mushroom proteins. And that makes a difference in the flavor profiles as we're going forward. And so food itself has been sort of broken down. Uh, you know, we know everything about wine, right? We know all the volatile chemicals of wine, of chocolate, coffee. You've seen these flavor wheels. No one's done it for mushrooms yet. And so I've, I've started that out. Uh, and this one is available right now. It's the 39 different compounds of mushrooms. Also the, the several, uh, the non-volatile flavor components as well. And really to understand like if there's a definitive way to say chanterelles pair with these foods. Chanterelles should be cooked at this temperature. Um, so that's the other project I'm working on. It's a long project. Uh, and I'm working also right now to get uh, my friends to send me my hard drive from the States because I have a talk specifically on that uh, that wasn't in, I wasn't intended to be separated from uh, this long. So that's pretty fun. Um, and this is sort of looking at the other side. So this is, a, this is a, the food sources of the different volatiles that actually informs pairing theory. So, you know, the reason that thyme and chanterelles go together is one of the most common volatiles that's available in, in chanterelles also appears in thyme. And so when you taste those things in your mouth at the same time, you're like, oh, these pair. Well, that's flavor pairing theory. So breaking down what is in a chanterelle will actually allow us to create more creative dishes uh, you know, and this is, I'm trying to do this with the 25 most common edibles. Um, so not just chanterelles, that just happened to be the first one that I did. But it's really exciting. This is, a, this is new information as far as I can tell. Um, and so it looks something like this. Uh, this is my, my, uh, my light reading when I'm not doing this, is to pulling apart uh, the International Journal of Food and Science and looking it through and then creating all these fun charts and whatnot so you don't have to. Um, but yeah, you can find all of this stuff if you would like to check it out on patreon.com slash mycophagybook. There are actually several free articles on there. It is a paid site uh, where you can, you can pledge different amounts a month and, and usually get recipes at, at the lower levels. But it's, uh, like I said, there is some free stuff on there as well. Um, it's been going for almost a year now. So there's essays on uh, mushrooms and being vegan. There's essays on um, why we need to actually expand our cooking literature into having three kingdoms instead of just veggies and meat. We need to have veggies, meat, and fungi in every cookbook. Um, and, and just sort of like putting mushrooms back in the place that they deserve, which is, you know, they invented meat and they invented vegetables. So I think that they, they deserve sort of a, a higher status in our cooking literature. Um, however, as, uh, as Kirsten mentioned, I do have a free cookbook for you guys. Um, and if you go to my website, foodbender.com recipes, 
you send me your email. I promise you I'm terrible at emails. Maybe once every two months I'll send out a like, uh, uh, but give me your email. You can have this book for free. It's got 63 recipes in it, mostly Thai, a lot of Southern Thai, some Mexican. It was basically what we were in quarantine for seven weeks. I cooked for everyone. I took pictures of everything and I wrote it all down. Um, so this was, this was my April and early May experience in Thailand. Uh, and it was really fun to put together. It gave me something to focus on when the world was freaking out. Uh, and it's yours for free. You can have it. Uh, I just got, uh, I'm, I'm in a new book. This is out of Colorado. This is my friends, Trent, Tristan and Trent, Trent, Kristen and Trent Blizzard. Um, this is a really detailed book on foraging, storage, preservation. Um, and it has 24 different foragers featured, including Eugenia Bone and myself. So this just came out on October 13th. Um, really awesome, kind of the newest book in the, uh, in the Mushroom Pantheon. And the pictures are just phenomenal. So do, do check that out. Plus, Trent, every year, puts out the Morel Mushroom Maps. That's his, that's his thing. He actually spends all winter long looking at where the burns were, looking at the pre-photos and the post-photos, identifying the right uh, altitudes, and then highlighting where the morels are most likely to be uh, come spring and summer. So a really, really cool couple. Uh, I highly recommend getting into their stuff. Uh, and then lastly, you know, my fiance's mission up here was to look at textiles. And one of the things in Thailand that's really sad is that they had 39 million tourists in 2019. And this year they've had, uh, well, there was 3.2 million tourists came in February uh, and in April zero came. Um, and so the people up here are really suffering, although they are more, they are more willing to have no COVID and a shitty economy than they are willing to have COVID up here, believe it or not. It's like 75, 80% of the population is like, keep it closed as long as there's a thing, but they're suffering for it. Um, and so my, my fiance started a, a trading company here called Traveling Traders Bazaar. Um, and we are buying directly from the, the Hill Tribe ladies here who are literally making the fabrics on backstrap looms. And we're making face masks. And we actually just sent two days ago a whole holiday package of, of a bunch of really cool, like, I think we're representing seven different hill tribes now. So check that out. Um, and then the Etsy site uh, should link directly from the website if you want to help out. Every purchase goes directly uh, to this, this fair trade nonprofit um, of, of women artisans that are literally taking care of their family and working out of their kitchen. So that's been really fun. So kap kum ma kap. I appreciate you guys. Uh, I'm open to answer any questions you like. Um, but that is the end of the presentation. Wow. Like you're clapping. That was super awesome. So I think you guys can unmute yourself if you want to ask questions. Um, and yeah, thanks, John, for putting that, that book in there as well. Yeah, thank you. How will yeah. we get all your information, all those different websites and all this stuff? You sent us in an email? Yeah, I will, I'll send a follow-up email that'll have uh, several recipes, the Thai mushroom poster, um, and, and some documentation, and then I'll have my information as well. You can follow me on Instagram or, or whatever. Um, yeah, so easy. That would be awesome, yeah. yeah. Yes, he has it already. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So yeah. evidently people do a lot, they steam a lot of mushrooms. How else do they cook them? And do they generally cook all their mushrooms? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, the, I'm, I think even the mushrooms in the Nam head are cooked first. I think they're steamed before they're pressed and fermented. Um, you know, the, the Caesar Amanita is commonly eaten raw in, in other countries, but I didn't see, I haven't seen it eaten raw here. Um, mm -hmm. What's interesting and, and is that most of those wild mushrooms I never saw in restaurants or in food carts, but they're getting consumed. Like there's ladies on the side of the street selling all these mushrooms. They're being purchased, but I think they're being cooked in people's homes. So I'm hoping that next year when I speak more Thai, that I'll be invited into homes and be able to see what people oh, good. are doing good, good. with the wild mushrooms themselves. Uh, and hopefully introduce them to the puffball mushroom and show them how delicious that is because they don't, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think steaming, steaming and then just kind of throwing it into soups. There's a lot of clear broth soups here, like bone broths with just a melange of things. Um, and then the, uh, the wrapping stuff in banana leaf, you know, like go mix it with egg, some chicken, some mushrooms, some veggies, put it in banana leaf and throw it on the grill uh, and grill this mm. package. And then you open it up and it's this steaming, delicious, awesome, awesome thing. Uh, nice stuff thing. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating. This is... Uh, it's yeah. There's a lot of techniques here that I never would have uh, I never would have known before. Um, you, you, know. mentioned, you mentioned 
that your that your fiance is into textiles? Yeah. Do they do any with fungi in Thailand? Uh, they haven't started any mycopigment. Using... Yeah, they haven't yet. In fact, I was gonna lead a mycopigment tour to Mexico this summer. That was I had three Mexican mushroom tours lined up, and Alyssa Allen was gonna come with me down to the Zapotec area to introduce wow. mycopigments to the Zapotecs who are using all natural dyes to dye their wool. Um, and so I would love to like figure out how to, how to get yeah. some folks over here. There's a ton of dyeing, although they do mostly cotton here. Uh, and so I think it's different as far as the, the mm -hmm. uh, ordinance are based. Um, but yeah, my, my Kim did take an indigo mud and uh, what was the other one? Dyeing class where she was doing like tie dyes on, on cotton and silk. Um, and so I, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what mushrooms are up here for dyeing. Because um, there certainly is a, a massive textile and dyeing operation that goes on all over in, in the villages. But I haven't seen it specifically um, as far as mushroom dyeing <laughs> go. Zach, uh, besides the mosquitoes, was there anything out there in the jungle that was trying to kill you? Uh, apparently, there are five meter cobras out here. Um, yeah, uh, and you did not hear that wrong. Uh, that's a long cobra. That is a gigantic uh, snake, man. <laughs> uh, uh, that's I 20 feet long. Yeah, that's and it's, it's long. real big. Yeah, king cobras. Uh, I haven't seen any myself. Um, uh, there are some spiders, mostly orb weaver. Like, they look scary, but I don't think they're too bad. Uh, and then there are scorpions up here, but I also haven't seen, I haven't seen those either. Uh, there were leeches, which are not trying to kill you, but they're very unpleasant. Um, and, uh, but yeah, for the most part, it's like mosquitoes are, 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 are the biggest issue, I would say. Uh, and then that, the fire ants, if you step in the wrong place, um, like, you know, ants in your pants. Uh, but mostly, yeah, not, not too many creatures up here, like bigger creatures. Um, I don't know if they have wild, if some of the pigs have escaped and they have wild boar now. Um, but yeah, it seems like mostly smaller Smaller annoying insects, as far as I could tell. A lot of really cool squirrels. <laughs> the squirrels are so ingenuitive. Our squirrels are eating all the coconuts out of our coconut tree. They're like chipping away at the outside and they get into the little shell and they're like, nah, nah, and then they're like, like a hamster at a hamster wheel or a little hamster feeder. They drink all the water out, carve a hole, climb inside, eat all the meat out, and then the coconuts fall. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> like they're, they're very industrious. Um, yeah, other weird creatures, a lot of cool birds. A lot of cool birds here, but yeah, nothing, nothing that's uh, that's too scary. Nothing like Australia, where everything's right. trying to kill you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. John, I have to ask: Are you also the John Young who wrote Bird, the uh, Advanced Bird Language, by any chance? Uh, no, that is not me. Okay. <laughs> Although I, I wish it was. What yeah, is, what is right. Advanced Bird Language? Yeah, that book is fantastic. If you all yeah. if you all haven't heard of that, Advanced Bird Language by John Young uh, is a fantastic <laughs> book. Uh, we've been using utilizing it a lot actually because we have an upstairs porch and we have these two trees. And like all through this last six months, new birds are flying in and hanging out, and getting to know the families and sort of knowing their feeding times and whatnot. It's very cool. <laughs> I see a hand waving there. Let's see. I see any other questions and also you know when I share everything um, if you have questions later you'll have my email good, and my good. direct contact as well so if you need to ask me anything uh, individually after we we part ways here uh, please feel yeah. free hey to Zach I got a question yeah hey um, I just uh, got I just found some kokora and uh, it's got it chopped up in my freezer and the only reason I haven't eaten it yet is because of the um, worry that it might be, you know, that people have that it might be phylloides, uh, yeah. Amanita phylloides. I was yeah. wondering if with that hemi, hemi yeah. um is there any deadly poisonous lookalikes to that? To the hemi baffa, no, um, but they do have a thing here called the Amanita princeps, and I got really excited when we were up in Pi because I was like, look, it's a death cap. And I like ran over to show my friends that I was hunting with. I was like, this is, this is exactly a death cap. It has, oh wait, no, it's got marginated. I was like, but if you pull it out, it'll have a ball. Oh no, it's got a straight stem on the bottom. I'm like, but it won't have any pith in the middle because that's, you know, oh, it's got pith in the middle. I was like, what is going on? I was like, this is a death cap mushroom. No, in fact, it is an edible mushroom here called the Amanita princeps. Um, uh, I wouldn't do it. I couldn't. I couldn't put it in my mouth. I was like, there's no way. This, is, this literally <laughs> is the death cat mushroom. Uh, and then I found out talking to some, there's a huge Hmong population 
uh, in California um, uh, during the fled Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And one of the most common uh, poisonings is the death cat mushroom in California by wow. Thai nationals who think that they found the Samanita princeps. Um, and so as far as I know, there are not, uh, there are not deadly uh, like common mushrooms up here, but Thais are often the target of the Amanita, Amanita phylloides in the States. Um, because the, it looks freaking identical <laughs> to this, but it was like, okay, I, I know nothing, you know? <laughs> it was like one of those chills go through, you're like, whoa, okay, this is not behaving the way that I expected. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure, you know, that, as I said, when we were walking out with the puff ball, the Hmong women were like, ah, you'll die, can't, no, might die, might die, can't, no, no can, no can. <laughs> you know, I was like, no, die, 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 cop, die. <laughs> um, hmm. So yeah, I think that they believe that the mushrooms they don't know are poisonous, um, but I, I haven't I haven't uh, learned the, which which ones are specifically poisonous up here yet. Well, hey Zach, that that was a great presentation. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, I was expecting to hear more about the food that would include coconut because um, I'm, I'm uh, crazy for coconut. Yeah. But, uh, I would think that anything in, in Thailand would, would be coconut, but you hardly mentioned it. Yeah. And I'm just a little bit curious, is there like a coconut uh, boundary line between South and well, North? Well, so the scent, what's called like um, royal cuisine or Southern cuisine um, is what was exported. So when you see like the restaurant that's got your, you know, your uh, Penang, yellow curry, green curry, um, that's, that's royal cuisine. Uh, often is is less spicy because it was it was created to be really palatable to foreigners. Um, so there's very little coconut up here, even though there are coconuts. Uh, there's very little coconut in the north. Um, it's a lot. All the all the curries up here are clear broth, um, and a lot more. Uh, they have like this really incredible finger ginger. It's like really thin and really pungent um, uh, flavor that now. That and uh, what they call bayama group, which is a kapir lime leaf. Those are like the flavors of the north, I would say. Oh. Um, and they have like a, a Zeshwan peppercorn that's like not actually a Zeshwan peppercorn, but gives that same sort of tingly buzz. But yeah, very little coconut. It was surprising to come up here um, and realize that I knew nothing about Thai food. Like none of the dishes that I had ever eaten were the same. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in Portland, Pok Pok and all of the restaurant chains of Pok Pok have now closed. You know, Andy Ricker. Uh, is quite famous for for making northern Thai food accessible to folks. Um, and Austin, who wrote the the book that I shared with you, actually took the pictures for the Pak Pak cookbook as well. So those two guys are sort of known. Uh, and I think David Thompson uh, has a northern Thai restaurant in in the UK somewhere. But there's not a lot of northern Thai that's actually escaped um, from this area because you know one of the things that you hear lob lob is one of the best dishes in the south. Very lime heavy, very like um, it's like minced meat with chilies and lime. Up here, it is like heavily spiced. Uh, it has uh, pork intestine in it. It's uh, they eat it raw sometimes with with bile. Uh, they're really into like oh! bitter. Like they're like, do you want more bile? I'm like no, <laughs> no. It's so intense. It's like a very manly thing, very bloody, especially in the non and tra, which are um, sort of uh, in the north still, but over towards over towards Lao. Um, they, it's like very manly to eat bitter, bloody, uh, chopped up meat. And that's like, that's like their thing up here. Um, very testosterone based. Um, so, and then Andy Ricker did put out a book, Thai Drinking Food, um, which I haven't, I haven't, uh, got my hands on yet, but it's, it's kind of more like what the local Thais are eating. And it's very not coconut based up here. You know, the coconut is much more of a royal and Southern, uh, and Southern cuisine. Hmm. Well, it's interesting because I, I, I would think like about 10 years ago, um, you know, if you go in the grocery store now, there's all kinds of coconut, coconut water, yeah. you know, fresh coconut, you know, green coconut. Yeah. And it's, and it's all coming from Thailand. Yeah. And it, it makes me think about like, uh, you know, 20 years or 30 years ago in California, suddenly they, they decided to plant avocado trees. Yeah. And then you know, there's a million avocados now coming out of California because yeah. of 30 years ago. So is that mostly in the Southern part of Yeah, the yeah, they do. There's a huge thing for palm oil. So they're like, you know, destroying the jungle to put up palm oil palms. And then there's coconut palms as well. Um, because coconut oil is a, is a big thing up here. I mean, there is, 
there are ladies here that are like grinding your coconut and pressing it into milk for you. So it's not unknown up here. Um, and like I said, we've got a coconut tree at our house. But I think uh, it's a lot more green coconut than there is coconut in the actual dishes. Uh, cow soy has coconut in it. Um, although I have in my in the book that I have, I have four different cow soys that I found from around northern Thailand, and only one of them is coconut based. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's very different. Like I really had no idea. I I had this idea that northern Thai was like tamarind and maybe some other spices and maybe this or that, but I had no idea just how vastly different as a cuisine. It, it's just truly a different cuisine than than what you what we've been shown as as Thai food um in the u.s it's similar to mexican food though right it's like something happens when you cross into the u.s that it just becomes this americanized meh, you know and that was one of the reasons we wanted to move to oaxaca oaxaca and chiang mai might as well be sister cities in different continents um the the hill tribes the textiles the the, the fact that it's completely its own cuisine within a cuisine that you think you're familiar with like you think you know mexican food then you go to mexico city you're like oh this is amazing then you go to oaxaca you know, like this is nothing like anything I had in Mexico City. Um, so it's actually been really great that we're we're able to continue with our life mission here, but just in a very different place than we expected. Um, so yeah, that's been it's been really it's been really eye opening. I had no idea, and apparently Isan, which is the other part of you know, Northeast Thai, is even yet another cuisine that's completely different than than here. Um, and they eat a lot of like water buffalo and uh, and lots of herbs and very simple, uh, very simple clear broth dishes. It's very clean food, not very spicy. Um, so might have to spend some time over there as well, though I hear it's very like the Midwest in the U.S. It's just flat farmland. <laughs> um, well, well, the trifecta for me is uh, coconut, coffee, cacao. Yeah, so um, we cacao have is in the in south here. Uh, mm -hmm. Coffee is in the north, you know, they converted most of the opium, the Golden Triangle up here, they converted them into growing tea and coffee instead of opium. Um, mm -hmm. So the Chiang Mai has, we went to a coffee festival here. I mean, it's, it's as modern, I mean, literally like 40 different coffee shops and all of them doing like their like hipster milk foaming <laughs> and the new like water process and cold. I mean, it's all, it is, they are modern, they are moderned up, you know, anyone that thinks of Thailand as a third world country is not thinking of Chiang Mai. There is like incredible incubations and all the kids here are really, really doing some cool stuff. Very similar to Oaxaca. As I said, they have like a 10,000 year history that goes all the way through Instagram. You know, they like, they have modernized and they are, they are down. It's, it's really cool. The coffee shops here are so cool. Really, really, like you could be in Brooklyn, you could be in Portland, you know, it's like you walk into a space, you're like, okay, they got like, you know, they're natural bags and they're like fresh roasted coffee here and 18 different kinds and like local pass through a gut of a cat, like whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really awesome to see that. The innovation is amazing. Their side hustle has side hustles up here. You know, if, if you want to make money up here, there's been a really interesting look at like what the idea of what freedom is. You know, America has this concept of what, what freedom is. Um, in Thailand, if you are really good at grilling, you can set your grill up in the end of your driveway and, and sell food. There's no licensing for that. There's like, so you literally, everyone has their specialty and you can just go to your neighbor and get food or your local bar, which happens to be in the auto body garage. They just serve beer at night. And there's this, this freedom to this, this un, um, what would you call it? Like uninterrupted life. Like people are allowed to just sort of live their life here. Now that being said, there's also a lot of protests happening in Thailand right now because you're not allowed to say anything bad about the king or the government without getting thrown in jail. So balance out those freedoms. You know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's, it's been an interesting look at like, wow, if you just aren't, aren't, aren't uh, like constantly bothered with, oh, somebody's gonna like stop me from like serving ribs to my neighbors. Uh, I feel like there's this sort of a, this relaxation here that is really, really enjoyable. Um, you know, people are just like living their lives. Well, I'm also curious about, you know, all the, the fish and the, the shrimp sauce. So in the north, where, where, does, where do the fish and shrimp come from? Uh, there's quite a bit of fish farms. So like tilapia farms up here. There's, there's uh, the Ping River. Um, like the north, northern Thailand has three major rivers flowing through it down from Yunnan and, and around. And so the rivers, they have quite a bit of river fish uh, that you get here. Um, there is a really cool restaurant. It's actually one of the, I think it's one of the only slow food 
um, certified restaurants up here, they get their fish flown in directly from Bangkok overnight. Um, and they, they work with specific fishermen um, to, to get really fresh, awesome ocean fish. And then the shrimp paste is now sort of, it's like a krill. They harvest it in, in, and it's like tiny, tiny, tiny little shrimps that they blend up to make into the, sh the shrimp paste. Um, so that's pretty ubiquitous all over the place. Um, and then in Isan and a little bit here, they have fermented fish, fish, uh, fish sauce. So nam pla, it means literally fish water or water, um, is like what you get fish sauce that you see all over the place. Here they have pla ra, which is a non-filtered fermented fish paste. It's really intense. Um, I love it, frankly, you know, but I'm like, I like weird things because I'm a chef and I, I want to like taste what people are into. Fiance can't do it. I put a tiny bit. Of, she's like, is there fish in here? I was like, babe, there's fish in everything. She's like, no, but you know what I mean. Is there fish in here? <laughs> like, yes, <laughs> you got me. <laughs> I was trying to sneak it in. I tried to sneak it in. And then, and then the rice paddies, you know, the rice paddies are often flooded for most of the year. And there's a, uh, there's a freshwater crab that lives in the rice paddies up here. And they mash that up and ferment that and make, make crab paste, fermented crab paste out of it, which had its own flavor. Mm. Um, we came home the other night and there was a crab on my porch. <laughs> it was just like looking at me. I was like, what the hell? Like, we are in the mountains. Like, what is happening? Uh, you know, huh. Edging around, like playing around. <laughs> so yeah, so when my, my landlady was like, oh yeah, sometimes they escape. People buy them and then they escape and they go running around the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> but they oh. mashed them up with the whole, uh, with, this, with the skin? The shell. With the yeah, shell? well, the, the shell and then they'll strain it. You know, they'll like, they'll ferment it, the whole thing. And then they'll, the, once it's fermented, they strain it into this paste and, and mash it. And, but yeah, if you get a, a papaya salad with blue crab, it just has the crab with the shell right in it. Um, huh. I, I have a theory, you know, like the, the language is, is really specific and like you say certain vowels in certain parts of your mouth and different letters. My feeling is that because they use their mouths so in such detail with the language that they're better at fishing out small bones from the, from what they put in. So it's just, it's not quite as much of a bother. They're just, they're just more capable of like, you know, taking care of the problem. So hopefully that goes, you know, I'll learn how to do that better, but you gotta be really careful taking bites here because there's probably something hard in it that isn't meant to be chewed. Yeah, actually some people can eat um, um, sunflower seeds and spit out. The yeah, right, yeah. Some people are quite- yeah. that, And do this in their mouth. And it's totally perfect. And I could never do that. I yeah. would have a mush in my mouth and have to swallow the whole thing or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're quite dexterous up there. Um. That's interesting. With the chanterelles, I wanted to say, you know, they remind me very much about a European German. I'm German uh, chanterelles because they are also much more tiny, but they have a much better um, taste. I yeah. mean, their flavor is so much more intense. They look, as the German chanterelles look a little bit different. They're short and solid. Yours look kind of like long and skinny. Yeah, yeah, these are really tiny. I think I did find what they're calling the Siberius, like the kind of the common, the common smooth chanterelle as well. I only found one of those, but it was, you know, four or five times thicker and bigger than the other, than the other chanterelles. So apparently they do have those here, um, but I never saw them in the market. So they might be less common. Than, than the little guys. The ones you had look a little bit like our winter chanterelle. Yeah, they do. They actually, they, they look a little more like craterellus. And apparently they do have uh, a craterellus here that's related to the yellow chanterelle, um, but I never saw those. But these were, mm -hmm. these were definitely, they, they weren't hollow stem. They're, they're yeah, cantharellus, right. not craterellus. Um, so yeah, I, I, I got out as much as I could, but it's, you know, we were just getting to know the city and just getting to know the area. So I'm really looking forward to next mushroom season to partner up with people and, and to go out several times a week to different areas and different elevations and, and really start tracking that. Uh, but in the meantime, really kind of like getting into the lore and, and, and meeting the folks. So yeah. I've done, done awesome work in the last, just in six months. That's true. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 What else? Is, <laughs> so uh, much I'm, fun. Thank you. I'm yeah. excited to see the the cookbooks and I, I love the scientific spreadsheets you're putting together about the active compounds and the foods and the pairing. Right. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So so I was there in uh, like late March, early April, and it's like a different world. Yeah, with the smoke. 
there was smoke. It was the end of the dry season. No mosquitoes right. at all. Even some of those some of those places you were talking about being eaten, there yeah. was no there were no bugs there. Wow. Um, and so yeah, so it changes as soon as it gets to the rainy season. I think. yeah yeah it gets very very green. I mean it's as green a city as anywhere I've ever been. All the streets lined with trees. There's like um, but yeah we've been told that when it when it gets brown and and dry that it's brown and dry here so haven't seen that yet but yeah this is like the third cloudless day in a row so i think we're coming in we're coming out of it now it's cooler too it's hot in the sun and cool in the shade you know i've been wearing long sleeves at night um so getting into the high 60s 70s at night have you had a chance yet to um have a meal at the sam cook home i haven't it's literally around the corner from my house i'm literally like it's like it's gotta be and like less than a couple blocks from your place. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I walk by it all the time. Yeah, it's spinning distance from my house. Yeah, I, I've been yeah. in contact with them. We haven't, we haven't quite done it. I think once we get the, uh, this, this holiday gift thing uh, up on Etsy and, and do that, we have, a, we have some celebration to have. So probably should make reservations and, and head over there. So you would recommend it? Yeah, I had a fantastic meal when I was there. I mean, it was like world class in yeah. every way, but I, but I think... Um, I just briefly talked to the chef when I was there yeah. and um, it seems like you two would get along really well. Yeah, that was the vibe I got in, in my brief discussions with him too. So yeah, I have yeah. to walk over there. And I, I mean, it's always nice to like purchase somebody's what they're offering and then get to know them because you're, you know, you're not just like milking them for information. But yeah, I think that one's on high on the list. Uh, yeah. You know, just somehow Michelin Guide released a 2020 um guide to Chiang Mai before before COVID happened I don't know I mean obviously they did their research in 2019 but there are 50 Michelin guide mentioned places here in Chiang Mai to explore really? um, and we've been to maybe like nine of them and they're all fantastic so uh, so there's definitely a lot of there's a, a lot more to do but all of our friends have been coming up from the south because it's rainy season down on the beaches now yeah. and every single person that comes to Chiang Mai has a completely different experience like oh have you found this we're like no where was that? You know, like each person finds their own little way up here. It's, uh, it's very, very cool. And you know, if it's, uh, if it gets more open to tourists, I may try to do a mushroom, uh, like a week long mushroom tour up here, um, next year, or if we're still here in 2022, which Good. I don't Good. know, but yeah, you know, that, that might be yeah. something to do as well. Um, when COVID another... is over with, we're all going to be trying to find places to go. So yeah. let us know. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, the plan was to do it in Mexico. I had three lined up. Uh, already in Mexico uh, with with Alan Rockefeller as well. Um, so maybe if I can I import him to Thailand, <laughs> um, <laughs> do some really fun tours up here. Yeah, I'll definitely let you guys know. Good. Yeah. And Look forward to getting the the links and the resources and everything. Yep. We, we will get that up on our website and we're just now kind of branching out. Be happy to put up your Patreon site on there and a link to that. and. Um, uh, a link to your food vendor site. Yeah. Um, that'll drive traffic to our site. That'll drive traffic to your site. Super. In uh, small numbers and be happy to do that. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Really, uh, really great to, to meet y'all here on Zoom. And, you know, my mom lives in Bellingham. So, uh, when I am home, I, I, I do spend a good amount of time in Washington. Usually, Christmas is usually when I come up there. So, just after mushroom season. Um, and I got to hang out. I actually shared a cabin with Paul Stamets in uh, January wow. at, the, at the Sonoma mushroom thing. And he invited me to come visit him up in, in the Olympics as well and, and, and whatnot. Wow. So I do have reason to come and see you guys, uh, <laughs> you know, mushroom yeah. season and whatnot. So at some point, uh, hopefully this will be in person and we can, we can go out and, and hunt and cook. Yeah, that'd be but great. You're, if you're in transit and know you're passing through and we're about to have a, you know, like, uh, no in ahead of time, yeah. Let us know. We'll, yeah. we'll see really. you again. Well, definitely. Well, there's always a good reason to go up that side of the uh, that side of the strait, isn't there? It's so beautiful yeah. over there. Okay, guys. Well, have a wonderful yeah. evening. All right. Um, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Feel exactly. free to reach out by email, and uh, yeah, I'll send those resources here shortly. Uh, exactly. Super. You, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Before you yeah. sign off, would you make me the host? I don't know what happened. Oh yeah. End. How do I do yeah. that? Uh, I think. I think you just go. What do you make? Can you just... hmm. There is some way as a host. Uh, oh, I'm the host now. Yep. Look at you. Yeah, you're the host. Tech wizard. All right. <laughs> I, think that I, I just have a few announcements.
few minutes. So, okay. All right. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.